All right, I think we're going to get started. Um, if people trickle in as the presentation goes, that's perfectly fine. I wanted to first thank everybody for coming, and a special thanks to our speakers today, Marilyn and Caroline. I'll let them do their formal introductions. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. A couple of housekeeping things. We want to keep this very informal for those of you that are here, so please feel free to kindly interrupt our speakers as they're presenting. Um, for those of you viewing online, we're going to stop periodically and ask these questions, so um, please submit them via chat. Also, we have a survey for you to complete um, at the conclusion of the presentation. And um, when you come up to ask, when you have a question, please come to the microphone so that our viewers online can hear you. Okay? Alrighty. Hi, I'm Marilyn Breedlove, and I'm a certified cancer exercise trainer. Um, I'm also an advocate of exercising during treatments, and I was also a caregiver for three years. And this is Caroline. I'm Caroline McCarter. I'm the yoga therapist with the Live Strong at the Y program. Um, I have a background in several different physical specialties and then also uh, working with cancer and yoga. So as she mentioned, we do want to keep it real informal. If you have questions and you don't want to go to the microphone, you can just um, raise your hand and ask them, and I'll repeat them so that the online people could hear them as well. So, um, so I thought we would just kind of talk about why we exercise during treatments and then um, give you a little background on the why. And then we were going to go through some demonstrations on um, a lot of the exercises that are most common with the people that, that we see at the Y. So um, as I said, um, just to emphasize um, why it's important to exercise during cancer, I thought I'd give you a couple of reports um, that there is overwhelming evidence that exercise helps cancer patients. And it was reported by the American Cancer Society from a group of experts in nutrition, physical activity, and cancer survivorship, and evaluated the scientific evidence and concluded that exercise is not only safe and achievable during cancer treatment, but also can improve quality of life and um, can improve quality of life in many ways. Um, it also recommends that during cancer treatment, you should do about two and a half, two and a half hours of physical activity each week, and that research shows that the exercise can reduce the risk of dying from cancer and minimize the side effects of treatment. The American College of Sports Medicine published exercise guidelines concluding that exercise during cancer treatment is safe and can improve physical functioning, quality of life, and cancer-related fatigue. And one of the handouts that we passed out is from the Mayo Clinic, and this one says, and this was just published a couple of months ago, Regular exercise in patients who have gone through breast and colon cancer treatment has been found to reduce the reoccurrence of cancer by up to 50 percent. So doctors are, deal. yeah. That's a big number. <laughs> and doctors are no longer prescribing rest. Um, they're saying movement. Um, stretch, workout, you know, help, you know, this, all the different side effects that you get from cancer, um, I mean, from the treatments. So over the last several years, um, Carol and I have worked with um, over 200 cancer survivors at the Town Lake YMCA through a program called Live Strong at the YMCA. So a little background on our program. Um, three years of testing in 41 YMCAs provided YUSA with a firm foundation for the beginning of this program. The focus is on, beginning a, is on becoming a credible and reliable community-based provider of cancer survivorship services and programs. By the end of 2013, more than 300 Y branches will offer the Live Strong at the YMCA program. To date, more than 13,000 cancer survivors have participated in the program at local Ys. So the Live Strong at the YMCA program is funded by the YMCA and is a group setting where we teach the survivors how to do the cardio uh, machines and weights correctly. We also do yoga to increase flexibility and balance. We have worked with survivors over many different ages and stages of cancer, many whose stories have impacted our lives greatly. So Carol and I, we specifically designed our program at Town Lake to work with um, exercises that help with the effects of, um, of treatment, such as regain range of motion, build strength, improve endurance, regain balance, increase energy, improve flexibility, reduce stress, help with chemo brain, 
lose unwanted weight gain, improve sleep, and fight depression. So just as you had a team of doctors taking care of you um, while you're going through treatment, we recommend that you have a team of people taking care of you during your survivorship. We've had lots of guest speakers um, at the Town Lake Y. Um, some include a lymphedema physical therapist, an acupuncturist with an oncology background, a nutritionist that's a survivor and works strictly with cancer patients, and my favorite, the oncology massage therapist. So um, we do all this just to educate um, all the different types of programs there are that help with all the different sites, um, you know, side effects. And so a couple of those things we were going to demonstrate. Um, the majority of the people that we've worked with have been um, breast cancer survivors, and so if we get sidetracked on that, please feel free to ask questions and we can um, relate them specifically to other cancers. So one of the main things we get is um, losing range of motion after surgeries um, due to either incisions or scar tissues and things like that. So one of the first things we'll do is a postural assessment. Um, a lot of times when people have forward head, it's called um, kyphosis. And so we work with um, kind of getting your, your spinal cord all in line and getting your chin tucked back a little bit. People that don't have cancer get this just from being over the computer too much, driving, texting, you know, things like that. So it's real important that you always, you know, roll your shoulders back and, and tuck your chin in so that your neck is in line with your, with your spinal cord. So how about we do that? <laughs> How about we do that? So even just Steve's sitting doing in it your, all, Steve's doing it already. <laughs> yeah, sitting, so sitting in your chairs, let's try to have both feet on the ground, nice and firm. And then I want you to like go ahead and let your belly hang out. Yeah. But then I want you to think about, okay, I'm trying to pull my belly button in and then up. So it's not just going straight back, it's going a little bit up. And then I want you to take your shoulders, just kind of relax them a little bit. And I want you to lengthen out through the very back of your neck. And then just lift the sternum a little bit. And then even again, tuck the chin just a little. And then you can close your eyes here. And you should feel like you are sitting pretty supported. So go ahead and open your eyes, right? So that takes some effort, right? It takes effort on our part to sit very mindfully up straight. One of the reasons is because a lot of the muscles in the upper back are just not so strong. And if we're thinking about, you know, somebody who is coming to us from breast cancer, you're thinking about different incisions, different ports are being made here. And it's always going to be this way for some form of safety, whatever you'd like to call it, and scar tissues, pulling this way. So there's a couple of exercises. I want to just give you one like very simple exercise to do that you can do sitting or you can do standing up. That's very good at providing this opening and then also strengthening these back muscles to help you sit up straighter with even less effort. So when, where you're sitting, depending on the room that you have, let's have you go ahead and make like a cactus arm. Okay. And wave, everybody wave. Uh -huh. <laughs> Jazz hands. Okay. And then I want you to go ahead and bend as far forward as you can and then reach your arms down, just how, how far they go. They might not go to the toes, it doesn't matter. Oh, sorry. And then I want you to take your arms, keep your head bowing like this, and then make the cactus arms again. And imagine you had like a lemon in between your shoulder blades and you're trying to squeeze that lemon. Make some lemon juice. And then sit all the way back up. And you're gonna continue squeezing that lemon. And then you sit up nice and straight. So this, you can do it, I have people do this over and over. Go ahead and let your arms relax. So you can do it sitting, you can do it standing up. This is very often a posture that we do, just trying to resist gravity without rolling down. And there's all sorts of different variations. Uh, as she said, we've worked with how many? Over 200 mm -hmm. different participants. 
and everybody is at a completely different level, not only in their recovery, but with a lot of other you know, physical issues that they might be having. I mean, they could have that, but then they could also have you know, a herniated disc or something in their neck, which is gonna make the movement different. So there's just one very good thing you can do for the kyphosis for the spine and the core to help with that, which is something we do frequently. Right, and so also, which Caroline was also mentioning is rounded shoulders. And again, people that even haven't gone through breast surgery, we get a lot of you know rounded shoulders from sitting over the computer and things like that. So especially if you've had, you know, some uh, in, like an incision or some sort of surgery to your chest or your lymph nodes or anything around in this area, you, you are protective and you're tight and usually your shoulders are rounded. So in that case, we work on um, stretching the chest and strengthening the back. Either the, the pecs are tight, your rhomboids might be weak or overstretched. And so a couple of ways we do that is again to stretch the chest and to strengthen the back. So just as Caroline mentioned, so a really good big chest opener would be with the foam roller. So these are just little foam rollers that you can get at Academy. They come in different colors. Um, I just have a cover on mine to keep mine clean. Mine is actually black on the inside. Um, the different colors are different firmness. So the white is gonna be your um, least firm and black is very, very firm. So there's short one and long ones. If you get any, get a long one. But for, um, for this demonstration, I'm gonna ask Caroline to sit on it. So <laughs> you're gonna sit at the very end. So I want your rump on the very end of it because I, when you roll down on your spinal cord, I want your head and neck resting on the foam roller. So go ahead and slide back to where your, your butt's on it. Oh, slide towards your head. This way? Yeah. So again, I want your head and neck resting on it. Don't come all the way over it. Okay, and so now you're gonna just put your arms out wide with your palms facing up. Woo, that's a stretch. It's a big chest opener. If you've had one side that's been affected um, and then has um, tightness and a scar tissue and things like that, they probably you know taught you how to um, a couple of stretches to do. So if you have one side that's tighter than the other. The goal is to get you to relax so that your muscles relax and open. So you could put a pillow underneath, like let's say she had surgery under on her right side. You put a pillow underneath it so that even this could be a real light pull for her. And then uh, gradually you could stay there for a couple of minutes and it would start to loosen up. And then you could either move it up or you could lower the pillow and just keep stretching and stretching. So it helps break down the scar tissue um, and it's a big chest opener. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Um, another one that they always mention is the wall crawl. Um, and so this one you would be up against the wall and you would crawl up until you felt the stretch. You just want to lean very gently into it. You don't want to ever, you know, push your way into it. You just stop when it starts to pull and stay there for a few minutes and then you can crawl a little further. Um, Caroline also does what's called the clock sometimes with our group. And so you would start at 12 o'clock and you're gonna stay there for a couple of minutes. And then if this was a wall, you would move down about five minutes and stay there for a few minutes. And then again, another five minutes until you get to a quarter after. But you want your chest to be square so that you're pulling away from the wall. And this is a really big stretch too. Again, really effective to break up scar tissue and get full range, mo range of motion again. Um, and then one for strengthening uh, the rhomboids, which are your mid and lower back, would be a reverse fly. So you could start with no weights. Um, I just have little tiny three pounds. And what you wanna do is basically what, what Caroline was saying with the last exercise. So you're pulling your shoulder blades together and squeezing that lemon like she's demonstrating right there. On this one, your back's flat and your neck is in line with your spinal cord and you're doing a reverse fly. So you're just pulling and squeezing your shoulder blades together. And again, strengthening the back and opening up the chest. And if you're working with that population, often if you just you know, go right here and ask them to squeeze your finger or you put something in there, they respond to that. You know, because sometimes there's different levels of body awareness there. So that's helpful. Does anybody have any questions about that? Does that make sense? Yeah. You said minutes. <laughs> no, for the clock, it's not minutes. It's for a few breaths. 
Uh, for holding but the stretches? Yeah, probably for a good minute. You would hold, hold the stretch for about a minute. And, and Caroline's right, if you would just stay there and take a few slow breaths rather than trying to count, it goes by a lot faster. <laughs> so. And, and the, the other thing is, is that we all have different capabilities there. You know, I was mentioning about, you know, a herniated disc or degenerative disc there. You know, and even just with blood pressure, sometimes people have their arm up like this for 10 seconds, they go numb right away. So, you know, it really depends. You might have to like bring it back down, shake it out, and then bring it back up. But that the whole thing should take some effort, which would take a little while. But that doesn't mean you have to be like real stringent. Yeah, you know, oh, this must be. We have some online questions. Okay. <clears throat> it says, just had a radical prostatectomy. Is there a set of exercises recommended for men with this condition? For what condition? They just had a radical prostatectomy. Uh huh. And is there an exercise for what? Recommended for this condition or oh, for somebody for who condition. just went through that surgery? Well, I mean, um, she just had the mastectomy, so she would want to just take it real slowly. Um, That's right. Prostectomy. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I thought there's a mastectomy. Sorry. Um, so, precautions and things to take. Um, you would want to. Start with weights, you know, really, really slow, and then work your way up. You never want to jump into weights right away. Um, you would want to probably start with no weights, you know, in the beginning and things like that, and then work your way up, um, you know, and always, you know, talk to your doctor. I'm not sure, you know, um, post surgery, how quickly, you know, everyone should work out is different. Also, you know, maybe it doesn't need to be mentioned, but you don't want to do a lot of abdominal things. Right. Right. <laughs> you know? So you don't want to do crunches until your doctor says that it's absolutely safe. Okay. And then is there a limit to how many times somebody can participate in the Live Strong at the Y program? Well, the program itself is a 12-week program, and we meet twice a week as a group. But you receive a free membership for you and everyone living in your household. Um, for the three months, and so we encourage everyone to come to the class for the you know twice a week, but also to come on their own whenever they can. So they're they're not limited to how many times they can come to the branch. Um, but after the twelve week class is over, can mm -hmm. they do it again? Usually um, not. Usually, I mean, if if they're not comfortable still with the machines and they've missed, you know, we have a lot of people that miss because they're going through treatment or traveling to Houston and things like that, then sure, we let them go do it again. Is that also um, just contingent on that branch also? I mean, would that vary by nation, I would assume? Yeah, everybody, everybody, everybody's branch does it a little bit different. Yeah, right. okay. and Marilyn would really be in charge of that for our branch. For your okay. Yeah, great. She, she would have the final call on that. Um, one more. Any suggestions for those with peripheral neuropathy? Ooh, we're going to get there. Oh, great. <laughs> we can get there Are now. Are we getting there now? Well, let's go. We can get there now. Okay. Any other questions from our audience here? Okay, so, so yeah, neuropathy. Neuropathy is one of the side effects of chemo. And you can do actually quite a few things for that. Um, in general, you want to bring some more circulation into that area, move it around, do some stretching. Um, one thing I really try to push in the yoga portion of the Live Strong, and let, uh, just in, in general, how, how a typical group would go is about uh, you know, 35 minutes of working on exercise machines like a treadmill or a bike and maybe some light weights and then about 35, 45 minutes of the yoga portion. So in the yoga portion, I stress balance quite heavily. Um, and even if you have a diagnosis of neuropathy that will never go away, perhaps, you know, it might just be something that's always there. It's still very good to do balancing things just to stabilize those muscles and get them working so that they're a little bit more secure, which would make it less likely like that when you trip that you'd be able to catch yourself, even though there's that neuropathy there. Is that making sense? So some very basic, you guys want to do some basic balancing? Mm -hmm. Okay, will you stand up?
so there's always the option of, of having a chair or a wall there, but one really basic thing to do is that cueing on your posture again. Okay, oh, is my belly just hanging out? Okay, I'm gonna try to pull it up and back. And then I'm gonna try to lift my chest up a little bit. Always focus the gaze, you've probably heard that before. And then let's all just try to lift up our right heel and then just try to come to the very top of the toe, right? So there's different stages. Now you should feel that standing ankle wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Those are the muscles that I want to get to to start creating some stability in the ankle, in the foot. And then from there, you just make it harder. You can lift the foot all the way up. And then we'll bring it back down. Mm-hmm. And let's do the other side just so. You can always do this behind your chair too yeah. if you want to use, use the chair for stability. So focus your gaze, draw your navel in, lift the left heel up, pause there. If you want, you go to the next level, just touching the big toe. And then depending, maybe lifting it up. Good and then go ahead and relax. So simple things like this in stages. And one thing I noticed, please, please, you can sit. Um, one thing I noticed right away with our groups is their balance increases. So quickly they get more balanced and more confident about their balance. And it's also one of the, one of our tests that we do part of the assessment but yeah part of the assessment we do this how long can you stand here how long you can stand here and everybody hates that part yeah <laughs> and it always gets better it always gets better yeah and and working the muscles in your quads and things and your ankles and so that also once those get stronger and practicing your balance it all gets easier and so we I mean we're everyone needs to practice their balance yeah you've been through cancer or not. it's just there's that you know, sometimes the neuropathy will lessen, sometimes it doesn't. Either way, it's good to continue to work on stabilizing those legs, and in particular, the knees and the ankles and the feet, so that you feel more confident. I mean, that's one of the great things about the Live Strong at the Y, is yeah, we're doing all this stuff in exercise and fitness and relaxation, but they're also walking out so much more confident about their abilities than when they first came in. So um, another thing we use is a goniometer, and if you go to a PT, they might use this on you. Um, what they would do is if you have, for example, breast cancer, um, they would use the unaffected arm first and check your range of motion with it. And then they would use your affected arm and do the range of motion. Like, for example, I used, I had shoulder surgery recently, so my, my arms don't go, like this one goes higher than this one because I don't have full range of motion yet. And when I do like an external rotation, see, I'm all wristy on this one. So uh, again, if you have one side that's affected more than the other, they might use this on you to check you so that they can use your range of motion either with your external rotation, your internal rotation, your abduction, and just see you know, where you are and where you need to be. So it's also a really good tool. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, precautions to take. Um, a lot of people that come to us are in treatments and have a port. Um, that's uh, different for everyone. Um, some people say, some of their doctors have been told not to swim with a port. Um, some people say, you know, they don't care and they swim with a port, in, I mean, that they can. So as far as we're concerned, we usually just don't put pressure on the chest. So if there are um, machines that you would go to the gym and you would, you know, be pressing against something, you don't want to do that with your with your port. I mean, obviously, you probably wouldn't anyway. But um, you would be careful with the chest press and things like that. So, um, just you know, take precautions if you do have a port. But and as for the yoga, the, the yoga part of that is, is if you've done yoga, you know we do standing things and step on the floor and then sitting. Um, there, number one, always just ask. It's a good thing to just ask the person you know, where they're at, can they lay down, right? Um, but there are so many different variations of the different postures that you're trying to get 
uh, the bodies to do that if it's something on the ground like a you know a cobra posture you can get someone to do that in the chair it's the same thing you know just kind of by watching and asking so right. I just thought I would put that in there <laughs> right and again if you've had um, reconstructive surgery um, again, more precautions you would take there, um, especially if you had like an ab abdominal tram or a lat tram surgery where they took part of the muscle um, from your latissima dorsi or maybe from your, some fat from your abdominals to use to rebuild the, the breast. Um, you would not do any lat pull downs or anything because you'd be trying to build a muscle that's not there and you know, you're building one that is there and one that's not. So. Again, you would just you know, want to make sure you talk to your doctor about things like that. Um, a lot of people, um, we recommend if you've had any lymph node um, involvement at all, and that means um, surgically removed or radiation, because radiation will damage the lymph nodes as well, um, that you wear the compression arm sleeve. Um, if you've had lymph nodes removed from your lower limb extremities, there is a compression leg sleeve you can use also. Um, you should be familiar with lymphedema if you've had any lymph nodes removed or damaged at all. Um, and I'm not a lymphedema specialist, but there are several really good ones in town. Um, and I would definitely recommend you talk to one um, if, if you think you should, because um, when you're lifting weights, they say to definitely lift weights, that it doesn't cause lymphedema, but you want to start with no weights and increase slowly. Um, contracting the muscle actually helps the lymphatic system, so they're definitely they're recommending to exercise with it. But you want to wear your compression arm sleeve when you work out, and then also, of course, when you when you fly. So, um, just a little bit about the lymphatic system. Again, not the specialist, but I did send, give you a handout with a specialist name on it. <laughs> um, the lymphatic system is part of your immune system, so it helps filter out the toxins. Um, basically, lymphedema is um, when the lymph nodes can, when the um, swelling occurs in the lymph nodes and it gets caught there, it is not, it's different than edema, like you can get edema anywhere where, and that's just swelling of the water near an infection. The lymphedema is water and proteins, so it's a firmer, harder um, swelling. Um, and basically, I mean, I've been told that the analogy is like, a really bu busy highway of three lanes with lots of traffic. One of the lanes gets shut down, so the traffic gets built up in the other two lanes. So if your lymphatic system can't flow properly, then it's going to get swell in that area where the lymph nodes were removed or damaged. So that's the reason for the compression arm sleeve. Um, there's manual lymphatic drainage that you can do, and then there's a uh, lymphedema specialist also that can do it for you. I was just going to say that uh, we often encourage this, you know, if they're walking on the treadmill, when they start to feel more comfortable to really sway their arms, even if they can do this on the bicycle, is really good. Um, there's, you know, a couple of yoga postures that you can do that kind of really, you know, you try to squeeze things and squeeze and release that are very helpful for that as well. But when in doubt, just keep, keep pumping. So your, your lymph nodes are going to be in your neck, um, in your armpits, in your abs, and in your growings are the majority of them. So if, if, if those get um, damaged, then your swelling will occur either the lower limb or the upper limb or the head and neck. So you always want the drainage to come back to the core where it can be pumped and filtered back through the system. Um, your lymphatic system doesn't have a pump like you know your heart pumps your blood. So we also recommend some really easy inversion poses. That doesn't mean you have to stand on your head. Um, one really easy inversion pose we do is, um, and it's also really relaxing, is to have someone lay down like Caroline. <laughs> and then put your feet up on the ball. And so again, you know, you could just um, relax here for a couple of minutes. If you travel and your ankles swell, this is a good one to do also. You could even just put them up on a chair um, or against the wall. So again, this is helping to boost your lymphatic system and to get things flowing. So um, it's also very relaxing and a good one. Mm -hmm. And then you could go like this and get some of that stretch And then you're getting here. a stretch too. 
So um, different stages of lymphedema. Um, the first, there's four stages. Um, first two are reversible and manageable, so you want to catch it early. Um, it's chronic once you get it, but it is definitely manageable. So you just want to catch it early. Um, there's a little test you can do. There's um, the pitting test, and basically you would just take it and like your skin pops right back right now, and if you had lymphedema, there would be a little pit there, and you, you wouldn't, it wouldn't pop back. There would be swelling. But um, also, if you went to a lymphedema specialist, she would actually measure your arms, the affected area, and then the unaffected arm, and then she would monitor it for you also. Are there other exercises or poses you want to add? <laughs> I don't think so. I think in general, for, for lymphedema, just keep moving. Keep moving, increase your circulation. Then that then we would just get to breathing, which we'll we'll get we'll get to. We can do that now. Are there any questions about any of that? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> any thoughts on exercise psychology? Exercise what? Psychology. Oh. Well, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, um, I mean, I what we've seen. The, the psychological benefits that we've seen is mostly just fighting depression. Um, people feel good about getting back to their normal um, selves and just feeling better and getting the endorphins moving. And yeah, I mean, in, in general, usually, even without a diagnosis, there's all of these endorphins going when you start to exercise. You know, um, one thing we were we were talking about, you know earlier is that there there can be such a change in personality almost um, Marilyn was saying earlier that you, you can't really be judgmental about the group when they come in if they're you know kind of snappy or, or irritable or real quiet that might not necessarily be them right. you know which is what Marilyn was saying earlier about some of our participants um, but one thing I've noticed is that not just physically do they leave more confident, but they leave more confident mentally and spiritually as well. I mean, this, it's not just a physical diagnosis. You know, it, it does a lot to your spirit as well. So to just be with a group that you can talk to each other, you know, uh, and give, we, we see them give recommendations like, oh, well, this is what worked for me. Why don't you try this? I don't, is there mm -hmm. anything you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I do think that it's not, it's not a support group, but people end up bonding and, and sharing stories and, and, you know, just feeling better about themselves and, and just feeling better. So, right. One more. Does everyone who has lymph nodes removed get lymphedema? No. Um, you're at ri your risk is greater depending on how many lymph nodes were removed. And I don't think they frequently tell you, like, how many. Yeah. I mean, everyone's different, obviously, but um, the more lymph nodes you've had removed or damaged, the greater your risk is. Thank so. you. And, what, and so I guess relieving stress in psychology, we were talking about yeah. um, the breathing thing. Yeah. And, I, and so you want to touch base on that? Yeah. I, I gave you guys a, a, a handout, and I think there's one also for you online that just goes, uh, I don't really have to read it to you but you can read it here, about how helpful the breathing exercises can be for the sleep issues, whether it's insomnia, sleep deprivation, um, you know, maybe really vibrant or scary dreams. And also for this, this people call it chemo brain or chemo fog, that the breathing is very helpful for that. Um, should we do a breathing exercise? Yes. <laughs> Come on, Melanie, say yes. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. And I'm hoping that, that those of you at home on the computer will do it too and not just be like, well, I guess I'm doing it. <laughs> okay, so I'm assuming that you people at home are sitting down, so we're all going to sit down. And we're going to try to find that posture that we had earlier. And why don't we get into it by making our spine all sulky, like you're back in school and you're like, oh. 
So just sulk down over your legs. And then I want you to bring your arms up into the cactus arms. And then I want you to squeeze a pencil between your shoulder blades. And then start to lift your chest up off of your thighs. And then the belly will start to come up. And then sit all the way up. Draw your navel in. Kind of wave the arms down to the sides. And then let them rest wherever it feels better. On your knees or in your lap. Tuck your chin down. Close the eyes. And first, just be mindful of what your resting breath is. So that resting breath, that very small and somewhat shallow breath, a teeny little inhale and a teeny little exhale. Now we're going to take a deeper breath. And we're going to breathe in through our nose or through your mouth if you have some congestion. And when we exhale, we're going to purse our lips and we're going to breathe out as if we were breathing out through like a coffee stir stick, very smooth and long. So let's all take a nice big breath in. And then softly purse the lips and let the air stream out. Feeling the lungs and the abdomen slowly release. Let's try that again. Take a big breath in. Feel the big balloon of your lungs and your ribs fill up. And then pursing the lips and then slowly let it out bit by bit. Feel the shoulders relax with the exhale. Breathe in. And then again, slowly out. Investigate how slow could I make this stream of air? Let's take one more together. And this time, how smooth could I make it? When you're finished, returning to your normal resting breath and maybe letting your chin drop. And feel the small movement in the belly with the relaxed breathing. And then slowly start to open your eyes. So the lengthening of the exhale stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. This is the nervous system that says, ah, I'm going to relax now, right? So the sympathetic is the fight or flight. Parasympathetic is relax. So lengthening the exhale in this way usually creates that relaxation response. So I will have many different techniques that I ask the students to do. We go over several options because just like with postures or, you know, a machine, some people tend towards some and then others towards others, right? Um, so experimenting with a lot of different ones, but always with this idea of creating that and stimulating that parasympathetic response, that relaxation response. I mean, I felt relaxed even though I was sitting here teaching just by lengthening the, my breath a little bit. And the yawning is a common side effect with that. You know? 
And so a lot of times their participants will say they'll do that at night when they're trying to go to sleep. And so they'll, they'll start with that, the breath and the breathing. And so it really helps them with sleeping. Um, and the exercise will really help with sleeping too, because you're, you know, once you get going and get your body, you know, moving and tired, then you're more tired at night to sleep, and then you can get up, in, you know, in the morning and stick with more of a routine. Yeah, the sleep is so vital. Your body needs that time to sleep. And if you're going through, you know, treatment and you're already tired, and then you can't sleep, and then you're more fatigued, and then no, I don't want to exercise, and then you know, so this I always ask the participants to do about 10 to even 12 of these when they're laying in bed as like their homework. And that's it. And usually the, the feedback is usually, I love that breathing. Yeah, that breathing is so helpful, you know? So even if they just get that one little glimpse from the Live Strong training at the Y, that oh, now I have this breathing exercise that I can do whenever I want to, that helps to relax me, that's great. Any questions about that? Questions or comments about the breathing? Are there any online questions? What about um, things we haven't touched on? Um, things that you wish that we would talk about that we haven't talked about? Any other questions? Really? We covered everything? <laughs> How can that be? Yeah. I know in the schedule for the uh, Y program, uh -huh. that I'm going to be traveling a lot in the mm -hmm. latter half of the year, and I don't want to sign up for it. Is mm -hmm. it too early to sign up for January 1? Um, the question was, if um, is it too early to sign up for um, the January classes? The answer is no. But um, the reason for her question was that she's going to be traveling a lot during the next session. Um, and so we encourage people to sign up, um, even though they know if they're going to be traveling or if they're going to have doctor's appointments and things like that. Um, it is not a boot camp. Um, and so we don't you know, hold you accountable for every single time. I mean, of course, we always say you get more out of it, you know, the more you put into it. But um, we uh, understand that life's unpredictable, and especially in the stages that you're in, it's even more unpredictable. So, um, you know, when you can't be there, you can't be there. So, um, you know, th it's not like you're going to miss something that you won't be able to catch up for on the next, you know, time you come. So, you know, if, if you want to sign up now and then just miss a few, that's fine. If you just would rather wait until January, that's fine too. We usually have all of our dates um, before the end of the year for the next year. And you know, people always ask me uh, when a good time to start is, and my answer is always everybody's different. Um, some people, their norm is to work out, and so they can't you know, stop working out. Now they may not be running marathons or running at all, but at least they're exercising or walking or doing something that they like to do and that's their normal and so you know then definitely come and then I have people who say you know I can't sign up yet I've got too much on my plate this is all I can take at this time I have too many doctor's appointments I feel terrible there's no way I can make it and I'd rather just wait until it's over that's fine too you know it's it's completely up to to you and you know w when you want to start and you know when you want to um, I mean it's not even a big commitment but when you want to commit to the program so in those instances when you have to start and stop back up, um, can you stop and then, let's say it's been four weeks, then can you go again for another, for the remainder of the time another time? Sure. Okay, so you can break it down that way. Great. Sure. I mean, honestly, we, we, I've, I've never told anybody they couldn't sign up. <laughs> so if, if there's space available, if I have a repeat who just wants to, to repeat, I always ask um, that they make sure that I have enough new people that want to do it. And if I have space available, I take them again. Great. But and then, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, I give, de depending on that situation, you know, I usually give a small practice for them to be doing at home after they're done. Because we really, <coughs> this is we're wanting to encourage them to keep moving. I mean, you, you heard that statistic that, that Marilyn read earlier. So we don't want to discourage them from, from coming to the program 
you know, or coming to the Y in general. We want them to be more active. I give them some postures to do after that that they can do for a long time. And we also encourage them, you know, we, we point out specific classes that might be a good fit for them. You know, like, uh, we wouldn't point at like Bikram yoga. We would point at like the gentle yoga, you know, depending. But everybody is also different. So we do, we encourage them to keep, to keep moving. And, and everyone in their household. I mean, the reason why we give the household membership is because we like to include the caregiver. It's, you know, it's very important to you guys that the caregiver is taken care of. The caregiver is usually not taking care of themselves. And so we, we always encourage, you know, the whole family to come. Um, we have a couple online. Are there any relaxing stretches? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's funny because oh, that's it kind of it, every person is different. So some things are really relaxing for the one and then like other people hate it. Right. I would just start with the breathing. Just lay down and do the breathing. Anything you do with the breathing will be more relaxing. But people tend to feel more relaxed on the ground. So I would do more ground postures of just lifting the leg and rolling it around, gentle twists are good to do. There's, I mean, one good uh, kind of a leg series that, that Caroline does, and I didn't bring a yoga strap, which I wish I had, but if I had one, um, where she just kind of starts with one leg and then with the other one, you know, you can pull it in and stretch your hip flexor. You can pull it out and hold it for a couple of breaths or a minute and then pull it out to the side. Your hips are still flat on the ground and you're stretching your inner thigh and then you draw it across your body and hold it this way and you're stretching out your hip and then up this way and stretch out your hamstring and then repeat it on the other leg and it really gets a lot of your major muscle groups and your legs and that one's very them. relaxing um, she also does it with a yoga strap and you keep your leg straight but um, but it's a really good one great what about exercising with adhesions what about Exercising with adhesions. Adhesions. Yes. Um, well, you wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't want to. <laughs> you would um, definitely talk to your doctor first before, um, I don't know, you know, how, how after the surgery. Yeah, especially if it's like, if, if it's on the arm that might have lymphedema or something like that and you get something there, you want to. Yeah, so you, yeah, you would have to talk to your doctor first before you do anything like that. Okay. And then um, I'm going to read this verbatim. Heat and humidity bother me more now after treatment. Ideas besides not exerting myself, which is not an option. Um, the cooling breath. The cooling breath. That would be it. The cooling breath. I mean, you, the heat and humidity could be uh, lots of different reasons um, from the treatments. Um, also, if your you know, body was thrown into um, uh, where am I trying, uh, some sort of you know where you can't cool off and things like that and so um, or menopause or anything like that so a lot of times the cooling breath will help and Caroline can teach you that one the cooling breath is it looks a little funny but it's very helpful so some of you have like it in your jeans where you can roll your tongue like this some of you don't and you just take your tongue and you put it you press it kind of on the teeth, on the bottom, and then you make a very small opening like this, like you are drinking out of a, with a coffee stir stick. But you've got to have the tongue right there. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> it's like, oh, weird. can you do a close up on my tongue, please? Um, so you roll the tongue or you place the tongue and then you breathe in and you feel the cool air on the tongue and even starting to hit the back of the throat. And then you usually close the mouth and you do this fogging exhale where you fog at the throat like this, but with the mouth closed. And you do like 10 of those, so you're immediately cooled off. If you can look it up on the computer, it will give you a good demonstration. I feel like if I was to really go over it, it would take too long, but it's, um, um, you could probably look it up in English and it would be like curled tongue breathing, curled tongue breath, something like that. In Sanskrit, it's called shitali. Curled tongue, inhale. Curled tongue. 
You'll Great. find it. It's 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 there. It's on the internet. Okay. And then you breathe out through your nose. Breathe you out. do, you breathe out through the nose, but with this kind of fogging sensation in the throat. So you know you can fog like this. You can do that same thing with the mouth closed. And it makes a small sound up in your head that you can hear. So you breathe in. And then you close the mouth and you breathe out. The reason you have to do the fogging thing on the throat is because you notice when you inhale with your tongue like that, your throat's gonna start to get real dry. It's bringing in a lot of air. So you gotta do the fogging rather than a normal breath out. And I can show you some of that later too, sir. And a lot of people say it really helps with hot flashes. Oh yeah. Another one. Are there any recommendations for exercises if you have lymphedema in your legs? Um, well, I mean, there are, if you already have lymphedema and you want to, um, the, like the manual lymph drainage, you would do exercises to keep, to, you know, to encourage the, the uh, lymphatic system to come from the legs. So you would start with just kind of rolling your ankles and your feet and just getting it flowing. You can pump some of the lymph nodes in the back of the knee. There's just a few right here. The majority are here. Um, and then I, and I, so I would start here. You could roll them around in different, you know, circles and flex and pump and then flex and pump here. And then I would also just do some, some manual uh, massages to, to promote the, the drainage back to the core. But that leg series that she was doing would be really good for that too. You know but again, I, mean? I would but seek a specialist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions about the program in general or what we do there or the group? Yeah. Are there any plans to expand on this program to a YMCA location, just like Orange Beach or Orange Beach Center? Yeah. Um, Hopefully. I mean, the, the question was to expand to more of the um, Austin branches. Um, it's currently at Hayes, um, Buda, Town Lake, and McNeil. And so, um, you know, hopefully that we can expand. I mean, they're, they keep expanding all over, you know, the U.S. right now. And so hopefully it will be at the other ones also. I'm sorry? Just keep checking online. Yes. Sorry. Compression sleeves. Mm -hmm. What is the there? Okay. How do you size them? Where do you put them? Um, you've got the, the compression arm sleeves, um, and they're expensive. They can be, and I think you, they recommend that you get a new one every year. Um, a good person to talk to would be um, the, Liv, the Livestrong Navigation Center um, because they can um, direct you to someone who can help you, like um, I think BCRC and um, ACS and things like that help with um, the compression arms and there are different sizes and different colors. So um, I know now that the, they used to be just in the nude color and now they're in um, black so you can look like the NBA basketball players. They come in tattooed and all that stuff and they have lower limb and um, upper limb extremities. So, but, the, but definitely seek help because sometimes your insurance will pay for them and sometimes they won't. And they're tight. They're tighter, and the material is thicker than just a regular ace bandage. Right. right. So um, it can, people wear them as a you know precaution to prevent lymphedema, and then once you get it, also to um, manage it. Did that answer your question? Okay. Are there any other questions? Neuropathy standpoint, uh, I experienced just me personally problems like my fingers, like I can't bend them. It's almost like an orthopedic thing. Yeah. And I don't have much information about anything trying to deal with that. It seemed like it was brought on originally by pressure got a little better and then it's got to the point now, it's been this way now for about a year. 
Yeah. I would I would do the if you can, I would do the ball. You know, like a, a he's got one recently. Tell yeah. That. So he was I, asking about um oh, neuropathy and in, in his hand and you're saying like a stress ball. Yeah, I would do stuff with the ball. Um it, it also, if I was your, you know, doctor or your therapist, I'd make sure you don't have any nerve okay. thing going on that would make that uh, like happen to you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I would do. I would do the stress ball. Um, one of my favorite things ever is the spider exercise. I do it frequently. Do you guys want to do this? It's great. So you take your hands, you put them all the way together, and you spread them as wide as you possibly can. And then this is like a spider hopping on the web. You try to have some resistance and slowly peel the wrists up. And then you're gonna try to have, be pushing on the ball of the hands. And then you slowly start to peel that away. And then you try to take your fingers all the way together. And then you try to squeeze them really, really, really tight. And then you slowly bring them back. And you do that like three times in a row, just to the best of your abilities. It's so good for your hands. And in general, it's good for arthritis and things like that too. Because they're probably starting to get stiff because you're not maybe moving them as much, you know, so the joints will get stiff. So I would, I would say that and I would do the ball. And get your hands up in the air. Would be good. Are there any exercises that deal with incontinence? With constipation? Incontinence. Exercises oh. with incontinence. They can help with that or alleviate some of that. I don't know. What I would say is as much as you can to do like what females have done for a long time is this kind of Kegel like exercise. exercise. Be doing that and be doing some, you know, good abdominal exercises for the very low part of your abdomen. Okay. Another one. With lymphedema, what exercise could I do to make the pouch under my arm get firm or decrease the size? So it's uh, swollen in, in the auxiliary in your armpit? It says the pouch under the arm, so. The pouch. Oh, pouch and over yeah. here, you mean? Okay. Um, well, I would wear your compression arm sleeve, you know, and you could, you could even um, wear that for, you know, a couple of days or something to, until the swelling went down. Um, also, the, like a manual uh, massage drainage. Um, you could also go get it wrapped from a lymphatic, um, you know, massage therapist. And that's a different type of wrap they'll take, and it's not an ace bandage, it's like a really intense wrap. And so, um, and you have to wear that for an extended time until it goes down but you want to do it um, so that it doesn't get worse so go ahead and catch it and go see somebody great I second the wrap okay but um, so you didn't um, talk about or somebody didn't ask about constipation but we do get it a lot with um, a lot of the um, meds that you're on and so um, one thing on the um, ball you can do is um, just roll around on your stomach, it kind of massages your internal organs. And you, so you wanna just um, go ahead and just roll around on it. You can do the front, you can do your back, and do your kidneys. And um, a lot of people said that it, it helps kind of massage your internal organs and get, the, um, get everything moving again. Do you have any others for that? I always say eat an apple. Okay. <laughs> eat an apple every day. And everybody I've ever said that to, they're like, I've started, uh -huh. and it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so you could do that too. Anything else? I'll give you one more. <laughs> you want. How about any tricks for the foot, feet? I have pretty severe neuropathy in my feet, and it gets, I mean, I, I haven't read extensively, but not very much actually, but in my own case, it gets, if I leave my feet down, like I've got them up down, it, it gets severe and with, with use. You know, if I walk around very much or like I wear real padded shoes now, and that seems to have helped a lot. Yeah. But the pressure on my hands and feet really seems to trigger mine, uh, makes it a lot worse. 
I would do this, the leg exercises that she was doing, the legs up in the air, rolling the ankles around, things like that. Um, and even doing what you're just doing right now in the chair. So he was mentioning um, neuropathy in his feet. Um, a lot of times you can just take your, your toes and, and squeeze them together, you know, like you're trying to grasp something with your feet. Um, and and also you can actually grab things. Like put something down there and see if you can grab it and pick it up yeah. and put it somewhere. Um, like I've heard that um, tapping, you know, just vigorously tapping your feet and your toes can help with it. Um, and then I've heard some people not have any success at all with with, with anything. Grab them you know. and move them around. Yeah. Stretch them out. All right, another one. I have a problem in my right knee. Is there any exercise to relieve pain? Yes, but I think that would be out of the scope of the... Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, it would depend on the pain and, and where it is, too. So. She described it as um, feeling like there's concrete in her knee. Concrete in her knee? Yeah. I think that would, that would, that would be a different, right. a know. different uh, talk. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Well, thank you. I know. Um, for those viewing online and for you that are here, um, this is our Livestrong Cancer Navigation Center. It's actually a little bit on the side and so we offer lots of different support services we have nurse practitioners so if you have any questions about your diagnosis or treatment options our nurse practitioners have been a really great tool um, they're really useful they give really really great information and while they can't recommend a treatment plan or refer you to a specific doctor they can inform you of what your options are so that you're able to make the most educated um, decision we also have clinical trial specialists so if you want to learn about clinical trials um, we can connect you with a specialist then we have patient advocate foundation so anybody who has any financial concerns are you if you're battling with your insurance company if you have questions about your employment rights um, we can connect you with a financial navigator. They can connect you with financial assistance programs or answer those general um, concerns that you might have related to your financial issues. And then we have our emotional support team. They can connect you with support groups or with counseling. And then Emmerman Angels, they provide peer support. So they can connect you with a survivor of your same diagnosis or they can connect care, uh, caregiver, a caregiver with another caregiver. So feel free to call our toll-free number for the national um, folks. That's 855-220-7777. And for our local folks, that's 512-220-7777. And you can also come into our center and meet with us in person. All right. Well, thank right. you. Good luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for thank coming. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>